This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Okay, so eight months ago, I designed a so-called translating stepper mode driver for UniPolish steppers. And I know what you're about to comment, so hold your horses. But as you can see, compared to a modern stepper drive, this board is quite unwieldy, plus it has a significant flaw. It sometimes misses steps when changing direction. So ever since, I've been working on designing a better, more compact version to make open source like I originally promised. And finally, the day has come. Now, if you're not familiar with controlling a unipolar stepper motor like the disgustingly popular 28BYJ48 using a microcontroller, you'd be forgiven to think those motors come with a driver already. The little PCB usually sold in a bundle with those motors, back in the day it looked like this, now apparently it's blue, isn't actually a driver at all. It's just a simple ULN2003 Darlington array allowing the microcontroller to switch the higher currents and voltages needed by the motor. The actual work of driving the motor is still done entirely by the Arduino, or whatever development board you use, which can be inconvenient because it requires potentially time-sensitive code and takes up an entire 4 I.O. pins. Depending on project requirements, that might be 2 pins more than you have, forcing you to switch to a more powerful MCU. Furthermore, if I want to use unipolar separate motors on a 3D printer or other CNC, which can be done even though this cheap round type of motor isn't exactly well suited, I run into another problem. The firmware on these machines is designed to run bipolar motors with dedicated translating drivers. So simply hooking up the ULN2003 isn't going to work. And as for modifying the firmware to also take care of driving the motor, well, good luck with that. So I designed my own unipolar driver to be compatible with the existing software ecosystem while still allowing me to use crappy unipolar motors scavenged from e-waste for free. And today I finally get around to building my newly developed compact version of this separate motor driver, which isn't only compatible but also plug and play interchangeable with the standard A4988, allowing me to literally retrofit existing RAMPS 1.4 and CNC shields and many other common 3D printer motherboards with unipolar motors. And and this is where people in the comments might, rightfully so, accuse me of fabricating a problem that doesn't actually exist just for a video. And yeah, there is an easy way to convert unipolar motors into bipolar ones, which allows you to use the dirt cheap mass-produced A4988, rendering my fancy new invention totally unnecessary. But hey, there's still some advantage to using a stepper motor the way it was designed, plus it's a very interesting novelty problem to solve, so I did it anyway. And I learned a lot in doing so, some of which I'll try to pass on to you in this video. Granted, having to compete with a mass-produced item like the A4988 made the design challenge all the more interesting. But let's start from scratch. How do you even drive a unipolar stepper motor? Most of them have five wires coming out, one of which is common to all four windings and usually gets connected to positive. Then all we have to do is connect the four other ones to ground, one after the other, and the motor spins. That's it. To make it spin the other way, just do it in reverse. Now that makes it run in full step mode, which can be somewhat noisy, so half steps are better even though they are slightly more complex. To do that, you power up the first coil, then add the second, which makes the motor go in between the two full steps, remove the first coil to fully latch onto the second step, add the third to go in between, rinse and repeat. As you can see, we end up with a very simple sequence of 1 through 4, or 1 through 8 respectively for half steps. The control signal CNC firmware like Marlin and Gerbil puts out is a simple pulse on the step pin whenever it wants the motor to do one step, with the direction of rotation it's supposed to happen in governed by a high or low level on the direction pin. So what I did on my first version of this motor driver was extremely simple. There is an integrated circuit called the CD4017BE Decade Counter, which does almost exactly that. Feed in a pulse on one pin and it turns on the first output, another pulse and it switches to the second output, then the third and so forth. And because they only count up but not down, I simply used the second one for counting down, fed the generated sequences through a whole bunch of diodes for proper merging of the signals without backfeeding, and piped the whole lot into a ULN2003 to supply current to the motor. Now, there are dedicated up and down counter ICs available, but one of those is already more expensive than the entire A4988, so because the incredibly mass-produced CD4017 Decade counter was only like 8 cents a piece when buying 50 of them, I obviously went with those. 
Now that approach comes with a problem. Because it's two separate chips doing their own counting, whenever you try to switch direction and activate the other counter, it starts up right back at zero, even though the other one might have left off somewhere in the middle of the sequence, which results in unpredictable lost or gained steps at the end of each move. And on a 3D printer, even just one lost step every time the nozzle changes direction could, and probably would, have devastating consequences. So how do we design a better one? By the way, please excuse the sudden return of my yearly cold, in case that's audible on camera. Well, the dedicated up and down counter ICs ain't gonna cut it. They're too expensive. And even though some current events would suggest otherwise, we do in fact live in the 21st century, and these little plastic squares, capable of doing more math a second than some people do in their entire lives, are a thing now. And they're dirt cheap. So I did what I usually do, went on AliExpress and bought the cheapest microcontrollers I could use, which happened to be the ATtiny13A, coming in at 56 cents a piece. Now these are by no means the cheapest MCUs out there, this SDM800 something is just over 30 cents a piece, but considering my programming abilities amounted to writing a bit of C++ code and uploading it to an Arduino Uno using the IDE, my highest chances of getting anything to work was by using a chip from at least the same family of microcontrollers. Now, from here on, things are pretty straightforward electrically. The ATtiny13 has six I.O. pins, just barely enough for what I need, although that's technically too few, as you'll see in a bit, and one kilobyte of flash storage, which I didn't even check if it was enough for what I was planning. Since basically the code takes care of everything, I just need to hook four of the I.O. pins up to the ULN2003 to drive the motor, and the other two are inputs for the step and direction signals coming from Marlin. But here I'm running into a problem. The ATtiny13A doesn't actually have six I.O. pins. Pin 1, called PB5, is referred to as an I.O. pin in the datasheet, but in normal operation it only works as a reset pin, which is needed for programming the chip. If I remove the reset functionality, I cannot upload any new code to it anymore, effectively barring the MCU from any reprogramming, which requires some extreme measures to reverse. It's like locking your car keys inside the car. But since I'm building a motor driver, which should only need programming once, that's not a problem, right? Just a massive pain in the butt for development. So that pretty much could have been the schematic, but I really wanted to add one more feature. You see, the A4988 also has an enable pin to turn off the motors whenever your printer is just sitting idle so you can manually move the axes. On my old unipolar drivers, this isn't possible. The motors just sit there, locked, wasting power and getting hot as soon as the printer is turned on. But if I want to add an enable, I need one more I.O. pin than I have. Well, fortunately there's this genius solution for sensing multiple push buttons using only one input pin by basically creating a voltage divider through the switches and measuring the analog voltage, allowing you to work out exactly which button was pressed because they all create a unique voltage. That's pretty easy to implement, I just plonk in three resistors, one to enable, one to direction and one to ground, so I can analog read the binary state of those two inputs and handle the motor direction while also disabling it to my heart's content. However, that wasn't good enough because I quickly remembered the enable pin isn't always in a known binary state. If I plug my driver into a breadboard for testing like I usually do with the A4988, I'll likely leave the enable pin floating, which basically incapacitates my voltage divider by removing one of the resistors out of the equation, resulting in erroneous measurements. And yeah, sure, I could just plug in another cable pulling into a known state, but let's be real. Who wants to do that? Plus, this wasn't the only issue, because if the driver is plugged into a ramp shield, the enable pin by default gets pulled high via a 10k resistor, which, if you think about it, puts it in series with the one in my voltage divider, totally altering the measured analog values, and thus the perceived binary state of the enable and direction pins yet again. So if I make a little table with the measured analog voltage for all possible combinations of high and low on those inputs, and repeat that for the two other use cases where the driver is in a breadboard with enable unconnected or plugged into a ramps board with enable pulled high via the 10k resistor, it quickly becomes apparent there is no surefire way to determine the actual state of those inputs at all times, simply because the measured values sometimes overlap. 
Luckily, that was a rather easy fix, because guess what? I don't actually need to know the direction while the motor's disabled. By simply replacing the enable resistor with a diode, it doesn't play any role in the voltage divider as long as enable is left floating or pulled low, which counterintuitively means the motor is active, leaving full authority to the direction pin, which makes the MCU measure 0 or 2.5 volts depending on direction. But as soon as enable gets pulled high, it floods the analog input with close to 5 volts directly through the diode. And this even works with the 10k resistor on the RAM shield in series because it's a much lower value than what my voltage divider is made up of, so it results in a measured voltage still sufficiently higher than 2.5 volts that I can implement a simple software lockout cutting power to the motor whenever the measurement decisively goes that high. I hope that explanation made any sense. I know I'm not exactly good at explaining complex topics in a concise way without using like 3 million words. I'm gonna touch on the software part later. For now though, suffice to say, that solution ultimately worked and made it through testing. My circuit boards from PCBWay just arrived. Let's build that thing and see if I didn't mess up after all. This is such a tiny box, which I guess is to be expected for circuit boards this small. And... Here they are. I of course chose yellow for the color because, well, that's what I do, but also because it's one of the very few colors Stefan Motor drivers don't already exist in. So now you know, the yellow ones are unipolar drivers. Oh my god, those are so tiny. As usual, they are excellent quality, not that I expected anything different from PCBWay. And I really hope I didn't make some mistake after going through so many iterations. And the black ones here, you might have noticed, are the resetter I need to break back into the at tiny after locking myself out by removing the reset functionality. Hopefully I won't really need it, because that would mean my code doesn't work, but while I was at it, I just went ahead and made some for the video to demonstrate. I ended up choosing black for the solder mask, just because I wanted to try some of the other colors PCBWay make. Anyway, I'll show you these resetter boards later. For now, let's go and make my stepper drivers. Now, I promise I'm gonna stop the flood of words in a bit, but first I want to talk about my new soldering iron. After my last electronics video where I complained about lead-free solder, lots of you guys suggested I buy a proper temperature-regulated soldering iron, so even though I like my DIY soldering station, I ultimately picked up a 908S for $6 to try out. And yeah, you're right, I can actually use lead-free solder with this. I still don't like that I can't use copper wire to make super cheap replacement tips for it, like I could with the old one, and I really don't like the stupid coating on those tips, which oxidizes and doesn't really wet with solder properly until it breaks down and exposes the bare copper underneath, at which point the tip gets eaten away pretty quickly with those high temperatures. But I unfortunately also haven't used my DIY soldering station since, so I guess this must be better. At least having an LCD in the handle of my soldering iron makes me feel more modern. Anyway, I already gathered all the components, not that there is much to gather in the first place, and the AT Tiny is already flashed with the code from testing, so everything should hopefully work once the board is finished. I'm also going to solder it by hand again this time. After the reflow disaster in the last electronics episode, I tried reflow soldering exactly one more time and decided I don't like it. At least not with this smoking abomination of a hot plate. I don't know, something's off. Maybe my cheap soldering paste is really bad quality. In any case, I prefer doing it by hand.
Well, not exactly a lot of components, are there? Only question now is, does it work? To test that, I'm going to simulate the step signal with a push button that constantly slips out of the breadboard, which is very annoying, the high or low direction signal with the toggle switch, and the separate motor with these LEDs. Here's what that looks like as a schematic. That way I can step through slowly and observe if the sequence is correct. Barring some major design blunders, the most likely thing to go wrong here is the order of the sequence being incorrect due to software pin assignments not matching this latest version of my PCB. Oh, and the enable pin is currently pulled low. I'm also going to test that in floating and high as well as high through the 10K resistor. Here goes nothing. First LED lit. And this way around it works. Let's toggle the switch. And it works the other way around as well, as you can see. This is exactly what it should do. Great, now with enable floating, nothing should happen and it should still work like before. Which it does. And as soon as I plug enable into high, the LEDs turn off which they should do, and it works exactly as expected. That's great! And now with enable plug into the 10k pull-up resistor, it works as well. Great! Well, that I didn't expect. It works just fine. Well, that's a delightful surprise. Totally didn't take me 8 months learning AVR development just to get these stupid push button activated running lights to work. But I guess you really want to see it drive a stepper motor, so let's do that next. Okay, so here I have the exact same setup and code I frequently use with the A4988. An Arduino sending step and direction signals to the driver, allowing me to control the direction and speed of the stepper motor using a potentiometer. And as you can see, it works just fine. And because, like I said, this stepper driver was designed to be fully compatible with CNC shields, ramps, and all other 3D printer control boards with plug-in drivers, you're probably wondering what on earth that single header pin spike on top is for. It's not an antenna to spy on your prints. The way this works is you plug Unicep into your controller just like you would an A4988, but because these boards were inherently designed with four wire bipolar stepper motors in mind, and unipolar motors usually have five wires, you need somewhere to plug in that winding common to supply power to the motor. So with the four phases connected to where the motor usually goes, the common plugs into the driver itself. Not exactly the most elegant solution, but it works and requires the least setup. But let's talk about the software, because this stepper motor driver is 50% that. In the grand scheme of things, the code I had to write is pretty simple. We have two variables, one for the step count, aka the number of the microstep we're currently on in the sequence of 8 microsteps, and a boolean for the direction. Whenever a step pulse comes in, it executes an interrupt service routine which increases or decreases the step count variable depending on whether the direction boolean is true or false. If the number is below or above 8, it resets the counter so we always stay within that sequence. Then all that happens in void loop is the analog measurement of the combined direction and enable pin to figure out if the motor should be disabled, in which case it simply gets stuck in a while loop turning off the outputs, otherwise the direction boolean gets updated. Finally, a switch statement turns on and off the motor coils depending on what microstep we're currently on, and that's all there is to it. To program a brand new AT Tiny, I first need to solder some longer pins to it to be able to use it on a breadboard because the adapter PCBs I got off AliExpress didn't fit the wider footprint. Then we need to wire it up to use an Arduino Uno as an in-system programmer like shown in this Instructables I found. Link to that and all the other resources will be in the description. I don't really have much to add, just wire it up and it should work. Go to Examples and upload the Arduino ISP to the Arduino to turn into the programmer needed to flash code onto the AT Tiny. Then download the board manager files they tell you to install. Those are kind of like some library that handles the direct negotiations with the AT Tiny so we don't have to. 
So now the Tiny connected to the Arduino and the Arduino to the computer, because it's a brand new microcontroller, we need to set it up before writing any code to it. And as soon as we select ATtiny13 as our board, we get a whole slew of settings in the tools menu. First, of course, we make sure we have Arduino as ISP selected for the programmer, as well as the correct processor version. Many of the other ones we can just skip, except the processor speed, which I believe is set to 1.2 megahertz by default, so I crank it up to 9.6. But for now, all of these aren't critical, because we're going to override them later anyway. We just need something that works for uploading the code. And it goes without saying, if you don't know what a setting does, leave it at default and it'll at least work. Don't do it like my dad, who always changes settings he doesn't know the purpose of, pretending he knows what he's doing, and mysteriously keeps breaking stuff. With those settings, just click Burn Bootloader and let it do its thing. Now, this doesn't actually burn a bootloader, it just configures the fuses, which we'll talk more about in a bit, for the AtTiny to be used. And that should be it. Now, if I upload a modified blink sketch via the Upload Using Programmer button, the AtTiny makes an LED blink all by itself. So let me just pull up my Unistep code here. As you can see, it's pretty short, seeing as it's also rather simple. And since I know this works, I can go ahead and upload it, again using the Programmer button. If you try to use the normal Upload button, it will fail. Ask me how I know. Now, at this point, nothing will work yet, because the chip resets every single time we send in a step pulse, so we need to remove that functionality before my code has access to that pin as an input. I mean, we know a microcontroller can be configured for many different use cases, hence why we had all those settings. On many Arduinos, you can see the Admega wired to an external crystal oscillator, whereas my AtTiny runs on its less precise internal oscillator due to space constraints. Analogously, you can imagine it like a room. Put in a couch and a TV, and you have a living room. Put in a bed and a closet, you get a bedroom. A desk and a computer, and it's an office. You get the gist. And some of those possible rooms don't have a door. Those are the ones without reset functionality, because you kinda need a door to bring in new furniture if you ever want to refurnish that room. On the AVR family of MCUs, the only thing defining which one of those possible rooms it's configured as is three hexadecimal numbers called fuses for some reason stored somewhere in flash memory. Change one of those values and it's an entirely different room, possibly one without door. And from here on, it's actually rather easy. This burnt bootloader thing in the IDE already set fuses for a configuration we use to upload, and while many other settings can be changed from here as well, there is, understandably for safety reasons, no option to disable the reset pin so people don't accidentally brick their processors. But we want to do it deliberately, and of course there is once again several ways to do it, so I'm just going to focus on the way I did it. The way I understand it, the underlying piece of software doing the actual programming of an Arduino on behalf of the IDE is called AVR Dude, and you can summon it via the command line and tell it to change those fuses directly if you know what you're doing, but for people like me who don't, there is a graphical user interface for it called AVR Dude SS. Or is it Dude S? I don't know, but here we immediately get a section dedicated to the fuses where we can enter new values. So we simply go to the AVR fuse calculator, again link in the description, and select our MCU model, which brings up options to configure. I'm gonna take out the divide clock by 8 like before to make it run faster. As you can see, the oscillator runs at 9.6 MHz, which by default is divided by 8 to get down to 1.2 MHz, but since my driver doesn't need accurate timing, and just has to be fast, I uncheck that option. Again, things we don't know anything about, we better don't touch. Here is Reset Disabled, Enable PB5 as I open, so we definitely want to tick that. Then we have Brownout Detection, I'm not 100% sure what it does, but I set it to 2.7 volts. In this application it probably won't matter, you could just leave it disabled. And the rest again I won't touch. Scrolling down, we for some reason get the same thing again in a little spreadsheet which automatically updates, and even further down, we're told what the hex value for the H and L fuses needs to be. It's only those two we need to change, and if I undo the disable reset thing, you can see the only thing changing about those fuses to disable reset is this B turning into an A. 
That is literally it. So we pull up a VR dude S, enter all the usual stuff for connecting, serial port and baud rate. I think I just had Arduino selected as a programmer. To test, I can click read in the fuse section and yup, that worked. It displays them in their respective box. Now I literally just grab the values from the calculator and type them into the corresponding fields. Click write and this takes a while to execute, but once it's done, I get a little success message. Now to check if that did the trick, I can just try to read those fuses again, but this time AVR dude just returns, yikes, invalid device signature. Double check connections and try again or use F to overwrite this check. That is how easy it is to brick your microcontroller. It literally just took changing the letter B to an A and clicking a button and now this AT Tiny is locked and cannot easily be reprogrammed. If I now try to upload any other code, I merely get the same error message about the device signature being invalid. On the bright side, the last sketch that was uploaded to it, my Unistep code, now has full access to the reset pin as an I.O. I won't waste time demonstrating this because we already saw the other one working where I did the exact same thing. But how do we ever get to reprogram that chip in case, for example, we want to update the code? with brute force. We figuratively take a jackhammer and break down the wall to get inside that room so we can reinstall a doorway through which to refurnish it. And for the AT Tiny, that jackhammer is called a high voltage programmer. Of course, manufacturers have built in a plan B to get out of a tricky situation like this, so the reset pin can exceptionally still be used for its original purpose by applying a high voltage of 12 volts to it. And while I assemble the beautiful black PCB, let me finish talking your ears off. So again, there is quite a few tutorials on how to make a high voltage resetter. It's really not that difficult, but I went with one of the easier ones by Sbinder on Hackster.io. It uses an ATtiny80 to reset the fuses of our target to factory default from where we can handle things via the IDE again. This works for most 8 and 14 pin chips of the AT Tiny series, so I simply merged the two schematics into one and plonked everything on a little PCB. There is a voltage regulator to create a 5 volt supply for both chips, and the 12 volts get fed directly to the reset of the bricked one, controlled by the master. And of course, there is an LED to do some flashing and tell us what's going on. Okay, let's see if that works. So the idea is I take the brick chip, place it on its footprint in the right orientation, and click the button. If everything's all right, we should see a brief flash from the LED, and that should be the fuse's reset. If it starts blinking, then I didn't get a good connection and need to try again. So here we go. And clicking three, two, one. And that is... Pretty much it. That was anticlimactic. It worked just fine. That brief flash, that is all it takes. Resetting the fuses. I'll just do it again. That's it. And that is this AT Tiny fully reset, ready to be reprogrammed, with the doorway back installed. I guess both of my PCBs in this video were a total success. So, there you have it, Unistep version 1.0, a fully compatible unipolar stepper motor driver. Did I achieve my goal of making it compete with the A4988 price-wise? Yeah, almost, I think. The AT Tiny 13 and ULN2003 came in at 73 cents, and with the PCBs being so incredibly tiny, at PCB Way, I can get up to 30 of them for $5, which, including the cheapest shipping, puts them at 33 cents, pushing the total to just $1.10, give or take, per Unistep driver, which is definitely in the ballpark of what a single A4988 costs depending where you buy it. Of course, I'm only counting material cost, but I think if someone were to mass produce this, maybe with a different MCU, it would be doable. Like I promised, this stepper motor driver is fully open source. Link to my GitHub and all the resources I use is in the description. With that and everything I covered in this video, you should definitely be able to build one yourself. Why would you? I don't know. Other than being easy to find in e-ways, there is no real advantage to using unipolar stepper motors on CNC's and 3D printers. And in a pinch, you might as well convert them to bipolar. 
Big thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and sending over the tiniest circuit boards I've made so far. I hope you enjoyed the adventure. Huge thanks to all my patrons for supporting these projects, especially Jobo who sent me a mystery box with tons of 3D printer parts he didn't need any longer, some of which you already saw me use as props. Next video we're finally gonna start a new project, so stay tuned. Bye bye!